Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSURG, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you CRAMSURG from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Hello, my name is Shruti Suresan. I'm an FY3 at Huddersfield Royal Infirmary, currently doing a general surgical post. Um, so today with Mr. Perrin, um, who's a general surgical registrar, um, we'll be presenting this paper titled Validation of the Liver Transplant Risk Score in Europe. So now over to Mr. Perrin to talk a bit more about the background. Right, just a, a few words of introduction about uh, why this study uh, is important. So uh, you might have heard if you've had some exposure to transplant um, that there are a few scoring systems out there uh, to determine the eligibility of a patient for transplant or try to predict post-transplant um, survival. Um, they're not particularly used in the UK. Um, however, they are out there. Some of them have been criticized for being excessively complicated, requiring a lot of variables, and some of them uh, are only applicable once the operation has been done, such as the soft score. So in this context, the LTRS was developed uh, in the US um, based on cadaveric liver transplant uh, patients' data uh, for indications that are purely benign, so excluding um, any um, either metastatic or, or primary um, liver uh, tumors, and as mentioned, is based only on U.S. population data. And the authors, uh, which are uh, which originally described the LTRS and are also involved in the production of this paper, used a variety of machine learning techniques, uh, including neural networks and uh, also logistic regression to uh, design the score. The original score, as described by the authors, uh, is on the right side, and as you can see, with this uh, relatively straightforward set of variables, you can. Uh, try and predict the likelihood of uh, dying, uh, particularly at 90 days um, after a liver transplant. Grossly, patients are subdivided. That depends on the publication you look at. Uh, in low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk, depending on uh, what their overall score is. And I'll pass the word back to Shruti for a little bit more about AIMS methods. So the primary aim of this study was to assess the performance of the risk course risk score in adult patients who had their first ever liver transplant in Europe. So by using the um, PICO framework, we're able to delve into this a bit deeper. So the patient group um, was adult recipients who had their first liver transplant in Europe between January 2002 and December 2013. We will go on to talk a bit more about this um, in the next few slides where we talk about inclusion and exclusion criteria. So the intervention here was having a liver transplant and there is no comparison group for this particular study. However, the outcome was to see um, the ability of the risk score to predict mortality post liver transplantation. So now back to Gio. Yeah, a little bit more about the study design. So um, as you can probably guess, uh, this is a retrospective cohort study that has been designed, as the title would suggest, uh, in Europe, uh, adopting and taking data from an international prospectively maintained database called the European Liver Transplant Registry. Now, this is a data set that has been around for quite a few years and involved now more than 170 institutions across uh, pretty much the whole of Europe. And as Shruti briefly mentioned, uh, patients are included from uh, 1st of January 2002 to 31st of December 2013, which is roughly the same time period they used for the original paper to describe the LTRS. And the outcomes that specifically the authors looked at are 90-day mortality, one-year mortality, and five-year uh, survival. Uh, there is an important caveat to introduce here straight away, and that is to say that the European Liver Transplant Registry does not include data on preoperative diagnosis of diabetes. Uh, therefore, the authors were forced to use an LTRS without one of the variables that were originally described in the LTRS. That does have some implications that we will uh, discuss later on. Ball back to you, Shruti, for a bit more. So elaborating on the inclusion exclusion criteria, um, as mentioned, first time liver transplant recipients who were um, included in the European Liver Transplant Registry and were of the ages of 18 and above. 
Interestingly, exclusion criteria-wise, patients who had a primary um, or secondary liver cancer um, were not included into the study. Um, however, patients who had hepatocellular carcinoma were included. This is a slight deviant to the original study, um, which did not include any cancer patients. The other exclusion criteria were patients who received um, inc incompatible blood types um, and those who had a partial graft um, and those who had graft from cardiac death donors and also those who had who may have had a liver transplant but also another transplant at the same time so people with simultaneous liver tra um, simultaneous transplants were not included and now back to you Right, let's start having a quick look at uh, uh, their initial results. So uh, in the time frame um, that the authors considered, 12,063 patients were underwent a liver transplant that were considered eligible for this uh, study. Uh, now, I must confess, I do not have uh, much experience in liver transplant itself, but looking at the baseline characteristics of these patients, uh, I do think that it would probably fit the average liver transplant patient out there. Uh, in terms of age and in terms of primary indication for transplant. And so EPSI um, and alcoholic cirrhosis uh, seems to be the two predominant etiologies for liver failure here. MELD score uh, and LTRS are also reported here. And as you can see, the vast majority of patients included were in the uh, sort of first brackets of the LTRS, either having a score of one or, or of two. Uh, way less of them were considered high risk as uh, four or five. Bolt to you, Shruti, for a bit more about results. So the paper showed that in terms of the 90-day mortality rate, there was a linear relationship between the score and mortality, and this was statistically significant. So for, pa for patients who had a lower risk score, um, they had a 5.6% mortality rate, and then we had, um, for patients who had an intermediate risk score, it was 12.9%. And for those who had a high risk score, it was 19%. Similarly, for the one-year mortality rate, results were statistically significant, and it did show a linear relationship between score and, and mortality. Let's have a look at uh, uh, five-year survival. So the authors used uh, a standard Kaplan-Meier method uh, to um, evaluate overall survival and compare groups based on the LTRS score. They also built a, a Cox regression um, model uh, to determine what variables were associated with um, survival. And as you can see, the LTRS score is actually reasonably good at predicting survival at five years. There's a few caveats about the Cox regression um, that we will be mentioning later on. And one important point, which I think is worth mentioning about the Kaplan-Meier method, is that censoring for this particular analysis uh, is undertaken when a patient either is lost for follow-up, which is quite normal, or when the uh, study period ends and the patient is still alive, or when the patient receives another transplant. Now, this seems to be reasonably standard in uh, um, sort of transplant uh, literature for the few papers I've read, but I am not entirely sure is the right thing to do, uh, but we can have a chat about it uh, towards the end of the paper. And so, uh, ball back to... So now talking about limitations, I'll be looking at the self-reported limitations. So the first uh, important limitation that we need to discuss is the fact that they didn't include the history of diabetes. This is because in the original paper, they used five variables to come up with this risk score. So now in this paper, which only looked at the European population, when you remove one out of the five um, variables, you're only left with four. And that sort of poses a question whether it sort of undermines the validity of the risk score. So that's really important to bear in mind. Secondly, the score wasn't validated in recipients who had, uh, for example, living donor grafts. And finally, they mentioned that the risk score was not directly, no comparison was made directly to other predictive models such as the SOFA score. Um, so we can't make a conclusion whether it's superior or inferior to existing score and um, predictive models. And now over to Jill. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a few more points that uh, we picked up um, as we were reading a paper. Um, well, Shruti already mentioned this obviously and the authors did as well. However, I don't think this has been stressed enough. If you take off one of five variables, is this even the same scoring system? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, 
a further point um, I would like to make relates to the methods that they use to test this um, LTRS. Now, the vast majority of the data that they use to support the design of the LTRS comes from um, particularly the um, artificial neural network algorithms that they created originally in the original paper that they published. And pretty much every software that you can use to do machine learning allows you to create an algorithm and also test the algorithm. And whenever you have a cohort of patients, you can choose to create the algorithm with, let's say, as a pretty standard uh, way of doing it, 70% of the cohort will be used to generate the algorithm and 30% to test it. You could actually select um, a group of patients that you want to test the algorithm on. So given that the same authors published both that paper and this paper, I'm not entirely sure why they didn't use the ANN algorithm to test it directly on these patients and then determine how the ANN algorithm performs against real life data. I think it would have been an interesting, um, an interesting way of doing a, a more direct validation of, of the scoring system. There's a few variables, as I mentioned earlier on, in the Cox regression uh, model uh, that were included, even if they were not statistically significantly associated with mortality on univariate analysis, such as gender, particularly. One more point. The authors focus a part of the discussion in saying that the LTRS is useful because uh, it would allow a clinician to target some potentially modifiable risk factors and therefore uh, potentially reduce mortality after a transplant. Now, having a look at the variables included, um, probably the only modifiable one would be BMI. And I'm not sure how feasible that would be considering that we struggled to do that for cancer patients. We struggled to do that with abdominal wall reconstruction patients. So um, I'm not entirely sure how much validity that argument has. A further point that I wanted to highlight is, uh, as I mentioned, the fact that retransplant patients are censored from the survivor analysis. Now, to me, that does make sense on one side, because obviously, if you're retransplanting, uh, you probably recalculate the LTRS score, even if it's not validated for retransplants. But on the other hand, you're probably interested in knowing how many patients that are retransplanted die, and also how many patients are actually retransplanted because that particular data is not available on the paper, at least I couldn't find it. And um, a few final two points that Shruti kind of mentioned, but the authors didn't highlight in their own limitations is that the original paper had slightly different inclusion criteria and the original paper only classified etiology in four groups where here we had um, sort of a, a, a bigger spread um, of potential etiologies to account for the liver failure. Right. Um, rant finished. Uh, I'll uh, pass on to Shruti for uh, a bit more about conclusions. So in terms of our conclusion, we think that the LTRS score can be applied to European population to help predict risk of mortality for first time liver transplantation. Um, and obviously with any of the score, we can't, we shouldn't use it um, alone and we should use it in conjunction with other um, clinical information. And this table sort of summarizes the things that we've discussed uh, regarding methodology and uh, the clinical domain expert. And um, yeah, I think this concludes our presentation. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. I think it is a really good critique. I think we've got one domain expert, one liver transplant surgeon. So should we start off asking Mr. Hakim what he thought of the paper? Yeah, thanks, uh, Sabha. I think uh, very, very interesting paper. So I think, see, currently, I mean, I'll just tell you what we currently do in terms of risk assessment for the patients. And, uh, and then I'll sort of comment about this paper. Currently, what we do is that, let's say, 100 people get referred to us for liver transplant based on, I mean, because it is such a complex operation with a high mortality risk. I mean, it's only about 60, 60 patients out of 100 will actually go ahead and have their transplant. So about 40 of them we exclude because either it is not indicated, uh, majority of them are not suitable or not fit for transplant. Uh, the, re the, the way we select them is ba basically based on two things. One, the, sur the surgeons assess, assess them and also the anesthetists assess them. Currently, what we do is that we just quote them as a standard risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. There is no objective scoring system for this. There is no objective scoring system. We are actually working on something along a multi-center project for this to looking at uh, sort of an, ob an objective way of doing it. It's all completely subjective at the moment. 
and and uh, and it's basically just based on experience and and looking at the imaging that is for the surgeons and in terms of the anesthetists they also do the same thing they rated a standard intermediate risk and high risk when you say standard risk you're talking in terms of less than 5 percentage mortality immediately after the transplant intermediate risk 5 to 10 percentage and more than 10 percentage will be your high risk so again they they do it based on your your exercise tolerance then your echo your pulmonary function test or, or sort of higher uh, investigations like CPEX and everything else. So that's how basically the, the current scoring system is. I think this introduces a bit of an objective way of doing it, this current uh, scoring system. Uh, but, but obviously we have already sort of spoken about the, the huge limitations of it. But even if it tells me what is the risk, it is just going to help me in counseling. And I don't think I can exclude patients based on this scoring system because uh, none of them, as, as, as sort of you rightly pointed out, none of them will change the risk for the patient prior to the transplant because I can't change the risk of the BH. I definitely can't change the MELD, MELD score. Um, I mean, it's, it's going to be the severity of the liver, liver disease. If the patient is on dialysis, they are obviously going to be quoted as high risk. BMI, I think Gio rightly pointed out, I think BMI as well, you can't change in, in, a, in a liver transplant patient. There are very few of them who can actually lose weight prior to the transplant. And we also worry about losing weight because liver, liver fa failure already makes them frail. They are sarcopenic, they lose muscle mass. So they're not patients who, who you can actually try and lose weight. So it's not really modifiable. Anything, uh, Sabha, that's, that's what I want to say about the paper. A quick few words about the rest of the discussion. Uh, the main topics we touched upon are reversibility of some of the contributors to the LTRS score, the use of censoring, and the importance of understanding some characteristics of the overall population that could be potentially involved in this study but is not based on inclusion exclusion criteria. So let's start from the first point uh, reversibility of uh, some of the LTRS component. Now, as we mentioned uh, already, um, correcting BMI in a liver failure patient uh, becomes quite difficult. And as Mr. Hakim mentioned, there are concerns associated with the potential of inducing even a, a, a bigger catabolic response, potentially worsening outcomes. Some elements of the MELD score, which is in itself part of the LTRS score, can be tweaked, such as sodium, INR, or creatinine. And it is known that some of those values can be modified um, using, for example, warfarin and obviously correcting the sodium with in-hospital treatment. Creatinine should be used as a pre-dialysis value if the patient is on dialysis. It's important to point out how tweaking those variables should not really have a significant impact on prognosis as artificial variations in sodium or INR would not realistically change the prognosis of a patient that is undergoing a liver transplant. Furthermore, we did touch upon the use of overall survival that the authors adopted in their five-year survival analysis as well as the practice of censoring patients that do undergo a retransplantation. Now, um, it's important to highlight, as Mr. Hakim mentioned, that uh, retransplantation does carry a significantly worse prognosis compared to first transplantation. So mortality in those patients would be higher. Our counter argument was then that perhaps then a more patient-centered outcome measure could have been retransplant-free survival, where the outcome considered are multiple, not just survival itself, but also retransplantation. A very further important point is related to inclusion exclusion criteria. Now, the authors highlight those very clearly, and they do say that they included 12,063 uh, liver transplant cases. However, they don't specify how many cases were actually excluded, which is relevant uh, as we do not know how reflective this portion of the overall population is compared to the overall population itself. Is the LTRS applicable to 50% of the overall liver transplant? 30%? 80%, it's hard to say. And finally, uh, Mr. Hakim elaborated on uh, the reasons why perhaps uh, the LTRS was not compared with other scoring systems available out there uh, by the authors. And this is probably because the data that they had available concerning these patients would not be sufficient to actually calculate those scoring systems. I will now leave you to Mr. Hakim's presentation. Thank you.
It's a pleasure to be here. I think uh, thanks to you and Sabha for for uh, for organizing this and inviting to give your talk. Um, so I'll move on to the talk. I think so. So I think when Sabha asked me whether I've been involved with any Delphi, I said yeah, I've been involved with it. Although we didn't complete the Delphi, I said it's still ongoing. But it's a very sort of interesting methodology, and uh, and uh, and one of our sort of common friend. Uh, Dr. Srinu was ready in Chennai. I think he he has done a couple of Delphi's, and I've, I've sort of been superficially involved with one of them. Um, so th that's sort of my experience in Delphi. But I think um, so over the next sort of twenty minutes or so, we'll I'll try and make sure that I make sense about what what we talk about Delphi. Um, so I mean, so what I'll be talking about, I think first first of all, let me. I mean, it's better to. I'm sure most of you know that Delphi is some sort of a consensus process, but but we'll try to read through the definition as well. And then I will present a paper, just sort of run through a paper so that you understand what a Delphi methodology is and, and explain a bit about where to use Delphi and how to use Delphi. That will be my sort of detailed explanation of the whole process. And then we'll look into the benefits, um, the limitations, and, and, uh, and then I'll give you some sort of uh, slides on what are the further readings that might be helpful to look at the Delphi. I think, I mean, uh, Saba was talking about this earlier, I think, Lot, lots of Delphi projects are being done and, and published in good high impact journals. So I think it's a sort of good way of working on it. And I'll tell you what, what are the positives and what are the negatives over the next 20 minutes. So, so I think, to, so basically to define it, and as I said, it's a bit of a consensus. So what you're trying to do is you get opinions from a group of people. Uh, it's similar to MDT. I'll just compare it in the next uh, few, few minutes. Um, it's similar to an MDT where you're actually trying to get opinions from everyone. You refine that opinion and put a sort of a consensus uh, statement saying that, okay, this is the refined statement. The way, I mean, if you look at the history of how the Delphi came was actually because I think the, 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 the Greeks were able to sort of forecast what can happen in the future. And uh, this is, uh, in the, I'm sure you would have heard about the place Delphi in, in Greece. And there is this oracle uh, temple where they can actually predict the future. And Delphi is basically a methodology where you can actually take a consensus about what people think about and, and predict the future. And, and uh, the first publication of, on this came in from the, from the RAND company, which is, actually, which is actually a large company looking at the warfare uh, warfare technology in US. And in 1969, what they did was they took consensus from all the experts to see uh, how many bombs Russia will actually need to, to, to sort of make a big, big impact in US. That's how they, they uh, that, that's how it all started, what we call as the RAND, RAND forecast. Uh, the, and that was in 1969. So you're nearly talking about 50 years ago when this was all, when this was all introduced, the first paper came about. Now, I think before I go more into explaining the Delphi, I think it's important to understand why it is different from uh, an MDT. I'm sure I think all of us would have sat through an MDT. I think one of the one of the things that you would have seen is that I think the, the person who's actually presenting the case might actually bias the way people are answering. Um, if you present the case and you say that, oh, this is what I think should happen, you're automatically uh, creating what we call as a anchoring bias or a first speaker advantage where you're saying that, okay, this is what should happen because let's say I have looked at the scans or I have looked at the blood results or I have seen the patient. So you're automatically creating a bias there. Um, and similarly, I think, I mean, I'm sure you would have sat through an MDT where you would have seen that there are some people who are really authoritative either because of their experience or, or maybe that's how they talk or, or people see that, wow, they're really smart and they always come up with some smart opinions and you will have this, uh, this hollow bias where you think that, oh, they, they say it's going to be right. So that's how we, we perceive at times. And, and, and also when, when sometimes when people, when people have already given an opinion in an MDT, let's say I'm, I'm the surgeon who's looking at um, somebody who needs a liver resection. I've said like, oh, I've looked, at, I've looked at it in detail. And then they say, oh, it needs an operation. And I don't really change my, um, um, because I, on a second thought, I might think maybe, maybe it is not indicated, but I don't change, change my views. Uh, at the at, uh, sort of at the next thought, because I feel that if, if I say no now, people might think that um, this guy is not very reliable because he said yes and then he suddenly said no. So you are worried about whether you've lost the face in front of an MDT. So these are the risks that we we always see in a multidisciplinary team meeting, which 
which you don't realize and we we do this we do this uh, every every day and there are there are there are lots of negatives of having a MDG meeting and and at the same time when I say about authoritative phase there are also people who don't talk in the talk in the MDT they don't come across uh, come across well or or their opinion they don't they don't they don't put it forward so these are these are the negatives so let me take you through a paper I mean this is actually a paper where they where they wanted to put in a, a curriculum uh, where a general surgery resident we don't know how much they actually need to know about hepatobiliary surgery and that was the that was the question because lots of general surgery residents when they go into a higher surgical training or a fellowship in hpb uh, they don't seem to have enough experience of HP, hepatobiliary surgery so this is this was this was the problem and they wanted to find out what can be done and in terms of whether we can actually lay a consensus uh, document where you can actually put in a curriculum i mean obviously to do that, the best way would be like having an MDT where you get experts from all around the world, arrange arrange a conference and sit together and discuss. But is it that easy? It's not that easy because you you will have to spend a lot of money to bring experts uh, uh, from across the world to sit together. That is where the Delphi process is unique because you you actually don't need to do anything physically at all. It all it's all done virtually. Uh, and their questions are basically how much the general surgery residents need to do or know, because that's going to impact on what will be their, uh, uh, how, how well will, will they be trained in on-call and emergency general surgery work, and how well will they be prepared to take on a fellowship. Basically, they went about this thing, the, the question they had, by taking an inter international uh, expert consensus. So I'm sure I'm sure some of the general surgical trainees on 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 this meeting would have would have would, would be using the ISCP, and and you would have seen the how the curriculum project is laid and it says like okay people need to know about liver trauma, but uh, but it also says in the bracket that it's it's only for specialists so it doesn't really tell you but this consensus document has not been actually put together through a Delphi process. It's probably an MDT process where people have written the curriculum and people have sort of said, okay, it looks fine, uh, but but it's not gone through uh, a Delphi consensus at all. So what did the what did they actually do? The, the, the people who actually tried to put in a curriculum for a HPV surgery, they initially did a literature search because they wanted to know what is there in the literature for a hepatobiliary curriculum uh, around, around the world. Um, so they did a PRISMA guideline, similar to what you do for a systematic search. So if you look at the previous slide where I was telling you that this is the, by means of a modified Delphi methodology, they used a modified Delphi methodology. So what is the difference between a modified Delphi and a, and a conventional Delphi is that in a conventional Delphi, what you do is that you, 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 in the first stage, in the first step of the process, you sit with a panel and you discuss the questions you sit with the experts you you put in a put in a questions and then you take it further whereas in a modified delphi the first process is very cumbersome they don't do that they basically just do the literature search uh, a group of people who want to do the study do the literature search and then invite the experts for further rounds of questions so that is the difference between a modified delphi because a modified delphi is much more easier than a conventional delphi i'll go into a bit more detail a bit later on so first thing is to do the literature search. If you look at the sort of the chart on the right side, they did the literature review, and then you design your initial questionnaire. This initial questionnaire will ask about sort of various various questions. I mean, should people be doing liver trauma? Should people be learning about the anatomy of the liver trauma, anatomy of the liver in detail? And then you do the round one, uh, and then round two, finding the experts, inviting the experts, asking them to look at these questions and then identifying whether the experts agree on this. So you, in the end, you what you try to do is you try to reach consensus. I'll sort of go into a bit more detail. So what they did was, then you start recruiting the experts and, and you have to define who the experts are gonna be. They define who the experts will be that they need to have at least a minimum of 100 hepatobiliary procedures and, and at least do about 20 major uh, liver surgeries annually. And, and for this study, what they wanted to do is that they clearly mention where the experts are going to come from, the sort of a mixture of Asia, Europe, and America, so that you have a wide variety of experts. And that's very important. I think you need to have a diverse variety of experts. Because you can look at various training needs across the world, and that will also tell you uh, what needs to happen in the UK when compared to what is happening in the Asia or the or the America, if you are doing an ISCP for the, for the UK trainees. So in total, they actually sent 52 invitations, and, and uh, nine of them 
uh, sorry, 11 of them did not respond and they included 41 experts from various different centers, uh, centers across the world. It's very important. So once you, once you identify the experts, then you send the questions, you frame the questions, you, you check the questions within your facilitator panel, and then you send it across to the experts. And the experts look through the questions and, and try to identify what they agree on, what they do not agree on. And you give them a specific timelines to, to answer questions and, and you give them reminders and you need to set up sort of uh, timelines for when, what if they don't respond, how do you actually get the responses back again? And here, what they did was they also have to define what will be the consensus because let's say there are 41 experts, you need to have at least about 32 experts that 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 uh, should have agreed on agreed on it. So if you have an agreement on a question, for example, if the question says that they need to have a knowledge on liver uh, liver liver anatomy, and 80 percentage of the experts agree on it, then that means that the question has been validated. You don't need to have a hundred percent. 100% agreement. And, and, and you can do some statistics as well. I'll sort of go into a bit more detail about it later on. So what they did was they put forward the questions and, uh, and, and in, in round one, about 41, 41 experts saw the questions. There were about nine, initially they had 101 questions. By the time it came to round one, they had 90 items. And, uh, and, and you can see that by the time they went to round two, there were some more suggestions from the, from the experts and it went to, uh, the number of items went to 96 items. And then by the time it came to round three, there were 94 items and two were, I mean, you remove the items where either uh, the, 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 you feel that, the, that, that it won't reach consensus because there is a problem with the, with the question or if the experts feel that these are not the right questions to be included, then you, you remove them. You basically edit the questions based on the responses from the experts. And then you finally reach consensus uh, based on at least 80% of the experts should have agreed on that, uh, on that question, on, that, on, on the question. So this, this, these were the results from the study. So if you look at the, they had sort of four domains, knowledge questions, I think knowledge of biliary tract anatomy, including gallbladder. And they looked at the median interquartal range on a Likert scale, and 100 percentage had consensus. So they included that question into the into the curriculum. Similarly, technical skills they had questions. Similarly, attitude statements they had questions which agreed on, and then they included it. And then the post-operative care statements. There are some questions where they excluded it because you can see that they had to exclude them on the first round itself because there was a lot of comment regarding this question where the expert felt that they should not they should not go through go through for the next round or the panel feels that okay this is not going to reach consensus and this is not the right question and and uh, that's because the experts have actually given some free text on it I'll, I'll go a bit more detail about explaining each and everything a bit later on but you exclude some of them as well so now coming into where is actually the delphi method is useful is when you have to develop some priorities. So it's a qualitative method, it's not a quantitative method. So it's not really scientific because you're looking at opinions from the patient and you can develop policies, you can de decision make. And so if you look at some of these examples, I think if you look at the, the top one, a modified Delphi, Delphi method towards multidisciplinary consensus or functional convalescence recommendations after. So there are some recommendations that have been developed, developed after abdominal surgery here you're actually trying to develop some priorities, what should happen in, for recovery after abdominal surgery. Similarly, there is an objective assessment. You're developing a rating scale for objective assessment in laparoscopic uh, appendicectomy. And if you look at the third example, you're actually trying to see where is the genetic medicine is actually heading. That is like predicting the future, what is going to happen to the future of uh, genetic, genetic medicine. And, and, and the bottom, the other one, the CURE project, is actually where you're actually trying to implement a strategy and develop a policy. So you are, you are actually getting an opinions from the experts and then, and then putting through a consensus document. If there are no expertise, then definitely this is not going to work. For example, let's say you have only a couple of set, uh, centers in the world who do some, some machine perfusion of a liver. And, and if that is the case, if there's no expertise on it, then it, it is not, never going to work. And similarly, if there is no evolution of something, for example, if they have machine perfusion in various centers, but if it is not progressing, if the same thing is happening for the last 10 years, then even if you ask any questions, 
you're not going to predict any future or you're not going to forecast a future or make any policies because nothing has changed in that in that particular field so it's not going to be very useful again where it's not going to be useful i think it is a very time consuming process so in terms of the evidence base it is it is an expert opinion so it's at the bottom of the pyramid so it's not the best of the the whole technique that can uh, that you can use it's a, it's a highly qualitative method not a not a quantitative method so just to sort of recap on the process what you do is that the first thing you identify what is the problem so they identified that the problem is they don't have a curriculum for a hepatobiliary surgery and the person who identifies the problem is the facilitator and you have a panel of facilitators you have a group of people who will help you you can imagine i think when you put in a lot of questions it has to come back it, you need to send it to the experts so let's say you identify 10 experts in the world it goes to the experts and then the expo- experts respond to them and if you have like 100 questions and expert respond to the 100 questions you can imagine the amount of work that it will create so you need to have some sort of a coordinator with you who can actually help through and 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 sort of see through pro- see through things and do a lot of coordinating work so it's a very time consuming process so you need to the facilitator will also be helped by uh, by by coordinators or somebody who can actually do that sort of a uh, administration work then you identify the experts you pass it on to the experts and it goes to a lot of iterative process where you identify what the experts are saying and then you remove the questions or you add questions or or you change the questions based on that and then it goes through the experts again so you do this multiple number of times and then you finally get consensus and then finally prepare prepare the report so i think i'll sort of go into a bit bit more detail on on the selection of experts so the the suggestion from there is actually no universal guideline for doing a delphi process so although the delphi process is actually something that re- reaches consensus there are no there are no universal universal guidelines for it they say that you should at least have about uh, 8 to 12 uh, experts more importantly they should be knowledgeable about what what you're doing and and uh, you you need to make sure that they have a good a good amount of experience in it and there are some there are some places where you might not get two experts where you might actually get uh, people who have some some information and some idea regarding this but you might not they might not be experts but it's always important to get the breadth of expertise so if you look at the the, the curriculum project they actually included not only the 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 surgeons uh, across across the sort of the centers but also included some of the trainees they included people who are attendees they included people who are professors so they included a wide variety of people some from the academic centers some from the teaching centers because it's the diversity of views that will tell you whether everything has been included every every problem has been looked at when the questions come across so that that's very important to think about and when you initially frame the questions you need uh, identify the experts when you email them you need to at, let let them at least two weeks to decide whether they want to participate or not and you need to tell them that their names will be confidential because when the expert respond back with the with the answer after you have sent them the questionnaire they won't be identified by anyone else that's the most important thing about the whole delphi process because it's completely an anonymous pro- process and it's blinded and that's what makes us uh, makes us strong because if somebody i mean if you if you again if you look at the parallel from the mdd the problem the reason why people sort of get biased is because somebody has been uh, somebody somebody who is really dominant tells them what to do and people don't change their answer whereas here you're sitting you, the experts are sitting in various places and they are answering and it's all anonymous and people don't see who has answered so they don't really know know what is the other people's view so you just give your own views and you don't you can actually i mean when you when 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 they come back again to the iterative process for example round 2 you say okay i've agreed to this question there should be anatomy included in round 2 you don't agree you don't believe in it then you can change it to a no so nobody is identifying whether you change it to yes or no because that's 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 the basic sort of uh sort of the importance of the whole delphi process that you can actually change your answers so you you don't you don't need to stick to your answers at all so when people are facilitating this so because it's all done online it's a blinded process you need to give a very clear information sheet to the experts and and it has to be uniform all experts should get the same information sheet and and because because for example if the if the, if the questions are not framed properly 
that can lead to a lot of problems. So you, your questions and your instructions, for example, your first round question will be something like, um, what do you think, uh, so what do you think residents need to learn about hepatobiliary surgery? Like a very open-ended question. Or you won't give options, you will give them an, a free text box to answer the answer, answer the question. And you need to really clearly say that this is a free text box and try to fill all the five five text boxes. If you don't give that information to the to the to the experts, then they won't fill it and you won't get adequate information. And it's very important also to stick to the timelines. You need to tell them that you, you will have to respond to each round of questions within a certain period of time, within four weeks' time. And if you don't respond, then, then that delays the whole process. And, and again, you need to set up a timeline when the reminders will be sent. For example, in the HPV study, in the hepatobiliary study, they said that, that it will be four weeks for them to answer. And there will be four emails that will be sent across. If they don't answer, then, then, then probably the experts will drop out. So, um, so in some studies, they also use the phone contact to make sure that you call them again to remind them so that there is no, there is no dropouts because the more the experts drop out, then the whole validity of the internal validity of the study goes down. And, and I think in the first round, uh, you need to have a free text box because, because you can imagine, I think if the, if the facilitators are actually preparing the questions, you're automatically introducing a bias there. So you need to try and avoid that bias. And, and the way you can avoid that bias is doing the actual Delphi uh, methodology, the conventional Delphi rather than the, rather than the modified Delphi. Because if you do a conventional Delphi, you can bring everything, everybody together. You can, you can sit together and then prepare those questions and then, and then start the process. And, and again, as I said, the most important thing about the Delphi is that they can actually, you can modify the statements. First round, you send a statement and you feel that based on the responses you get, the statements are not right, then you can modify the, modify the statements. And then you can actually propose additional items. You can remove statements um, based on what, what the responses are um, and, and clearly define what will be your inclusion and exclusion criteria for all this uh, round. So again, round one needs to be a clear cut open-ended questions. Um, it, this is where you actually generate a lot of ideas and, and keep it to a limited number of questions. So because you round one, you cannot have a huge number of questions. You want to keep it to a limited number of questions so that you generate a lot of ideas. For example, as, as I said, a broad question asking, what do, the, what do you think they need to know in terms of the knowledge? Then you can ask, what do you think they need to know in terms of the technique? Then you can ask, what do you think they need to know in terms of the post-operative care for HPV surgery? And then you can actually pilot this as well to find out whether this is all working well. You can send it to a send it to let's say five experts you identify who are not included in the final study, and then and then and then you can modify the questions because some questions might not be very clear in the first go. So so that's very important. I think the most important thing, like like anything that you do in research, uh, if you if your first questions are not right, like if you if you put garbage in, then garbage out. I'm sure you would have heard about this. And, and your questions need to be very clear, not vague and ambiguous in the first round. And, and so you can imagine when you put a round one questions where you're leaving a lot of free text boxes, you will get a large amount of data. You'll get a large amount of qualitative data and it will be hugely worded because some people might be writing sentences to explain each and everything. Um, and, 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 and then you have to sit together and, and within your panel, which is the facilitator panel, and then group to group them together. You can use uh, on the left side, you can see the affinity diagram where you can actually identify specific domains and then and then group them in it. So I was speaking to Dr. Reddy who has done this project on, um, on, on identifying liver transplant for patients who have rat, rat killer poisoning. And, and he was telling me that they identified sort of the initial questions and then, and then they felt that probably you should have surgeons answering a specific part of the questions for this problem. So for example, if you have a risk score, then you can identify an anesthetist probably will answer this particular question. Uh, surgeons should answer this question because, because if you ask questions about echo, surgeons might not, not, not actually have a, have a good answer to it. So you need to be able to pick up domains or pick up sort of, you, you should be able to substratify these, these into different, uh, different questions. You need to have some affinity diagrams. And similarly, you can you can identify the problem and then do this sort of fish bone structure where you identify each and every structure and, and, and be able to put them together into separate questions. 
So this is a lot of work. That's why I was saying that until you need a Delphi, don't do a Delphi because it is it is very time consuming, and it and it takes a lot of lot of time. Um, then when you come to so after you've had those open ended questions, let's say you have sent ten open ended questions, and then you group them together. Now you can actually put forward from ten you will end up with fifty questions because now you have a bit more clarity on what questions to ask. It can be sort of, it has to be a close-ended question because that will help you to, um, one, ask, you can ask directly an SN, yes or no question. So you can ask, should they be confident in doing a liver trauma? Yes or no. You can ask something like that, or you can have a rating scale, like Likert scale, where you have Likert scale, or or you sort of, sort of strongly disagree to a, strongly agree, like, uh, like I mean, similarly, like a Likert scale. You can ask that. So then you go into a sort of a lot of iteration where you do round two, then you 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 get answers from them. Let's say from round two, uh, about thirty percentage of those questions have reached consensus. To to have a consensus, you should have already thought about what will be your consensus percentage. So they say that an agreement will be at least if you if fifty one percentage or or up to about eighty percentage of people agree on that. But ideally, people say that you should have at least about eighty percentage consensus before you can agree on that statement. So 80% of people, experts should agree on it. And this needs to be decided well before the data, data well before the questions are sent to the panel. And in a categorical data, let's say an essay or no question, you are thinking in terms of percentage agreement. For a continuous data like a Likert scale, you use a median score for the Likert, but it's the interquartile range that actually makes a difference because if there is no difference between the experts and your interquartile range is less than or equal to one, then you note that they are all sort of agreeing and they all score five on the Likert scale, then, then that's how you actually reach consensus. So based on the interquartile range. And round two, once you get the round two, then you gather it, you sit together, you prepare the questions, and then you analyze, and then you go back again to round two. So you do this multiple times until you reach your, your consensus for all the questions. So the most important thing at, at, at this point of time, at each round, it's important to, if you, if you see the table below, this is just an example, you need to tell them what was their response in round two, what was the response of the group in round two, and then you need to give them an option that they can change their response because people might change their response based on what the whole iterative group sort of ex expert lot are thinking. And, and obviously people, I think that is, that is the chance you give them to change the response. That is the difference between, uh, let's say an MDT, the face value thing where people are not keen to change the response to actually letting them to change the response and, and allow chance to respond. And I think some people say that the, the questions that have already reached consensus should be taken out because what is happening here is, let's say they started with 90. I mean, if you look at the HPB project, they started with 101, then it went to 90, then 96. So the problem of keeping all the questions again for the further rounds is you're actually giving them again a huge number of questions, huge number of time to actually go through that and a lot time consuming. And there is a risk that the number of times they answer this, they might actually not answer it properly. So there is a risk that you're not going to get uh, right answers again. So people say that you should actually remove, once you've already reached consensus at a certain stage, at, let's say round three, you've reached consensus on 40 out of 50 questions, then people say that you should remove them at that stage. But it's very, it's very controversial. But it makes sense that if you look at it on one way that uh, people don't want to really keep answering the same thing again and again. Uh, because because it's time consuming and you will have expert dropout. So overall, in terms of the analysis, I think, as I said, it's a qualitative analysis. You, you analyze the open-ended questions, but you also have the sort of quantitative analysis when you go into round two, round three, and subsequent rounds. Um, you calculate the consensus, you calculate the ratings, and then you can actually rank the responses based, based on the consensus achieved. As I said, the interquantile range is the most important thing because that tells you how close you're not trying to find out whether your questions, the experts agree on your questions. You're trying to find out whether the ex experts agree on that the, the, the topic of that question. If you understand what I'm trying to say, whether the experts agree, whether the, whether the surgeons, the, the, the general surgery residents should be confident in doing liver trauma rather than, rather than the question. 
the way you frame the question. They should be able to understand, they should be able to come closer to consensus on the, the, the topic that we are talking about rather than the actual question. So, so that's the whole, sort of whole thing about the process of uh, Delphi. So you just keep going until you reach consensus. Once you reach consensus, then you write a report, you, you, tell, you, you send it to the experts, make sure that they are involved and then you publish, you publish the consensus. So I think the benefit is basically it removes the problems of the focus groups like dominant personalities, the pressure, the group pressure that can that can come, and also the noise that happens when people are uh, digressing in a in an MDT, talking about lots of other things, which can actually confuse people in making decisions. And and you you use a huge amount of experts around the world because it's all done in an anonymous manner. It completely removes the bias that can happen. But but obviously there is some bias in it because if you give them chances to change their question, like a, telling them what the experts, uh, what the what the group thinks, and what they've done previously, and then chance to change, it does introduce bias because. But but what it doesn't tell you tell them is who has actually made the decision. They don't get to know that, so it's all completely anonymous, and it removes the perception um, from what what others think. Obviously, there are lots of limitations. Some of them I've actually covered before. It takes a long time to reach consensus, so you will have uh, the expert dropout. This is where you need to keep them motivated by frequent emails and avoid delays in the process. So if you say like somebody is not responding, you cannot really keep going with it. And also your processes, your processes of synthesizing the data should be done in time so that you don't lose experts. And, and you need to prepare high quality reports, which doesn't conflict the next question or which doesn't cause confusion. So you don't, you avoid the garbage and garbage of problems. And, uh, and, and I think, I mean, none of the questions should actually introduce bias. So that's where having the initial focus group meeting, having the initial inter interview might actually help you to sort of frame the questions well. And, and also having a diverse group of people will, will help, will help because if you have, general surgery resident thinking about their own curriculum rather than somebody else senior laying the curriculum it will help as well for them to understand what they should what they should do um, obviously as i said it's all very subjective because you're talking about opinions so the level of evidence is very less and uh, and the internal validity of this is largely unknown so uh, but it's all completely opinion opinion based so these are some of the things that you can read. There's a very good book I, uh, I've sort of looked into when I was doing, when, when we started a research project on machine profession, which we are currently doing, where we have reached about uh, sort of um, round, round four at the moment, and it's going through a lot of iteration. And, and you can also look into some of the checklists that is available on doing, doing Delphi, Delphi and the sort of link for the project that I, that I spoke. And there's one sort of YouTube video, which I found very, very useful uh, preparing this talk as well, I think, which you can look at. Thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.